Hi there, I had a student today and we had a really lovely lesson, so I'm posting about her lesson in particular, but talking about it generally in case there's somebody else that wants to learn about it. I'm not sure how this video will post my bow arm versus my left arm and doing that mirror image thing. So this is like this Dr. Scholl's chair thing. She liked that one better and this is this Plexio one which I really enjoyed for driving because sometimes I, if I'm driving for a long time, I, I had a fall forward down a flight of stairs a number of years ago. I highly recommend not doing that. Sometimes a cushion like this can feel better on a chair, especially if you're at a school that has these molded chairs that are shapes that really, they were supposed to be comfortable, but they're not, oops. Anyway, so um, she happened to like the Dr. Show one better. I, mean, I have a taller student too. It's nice for taller students because <coughs> chairs can sometimes almost make you, like if this were your hips, you know, they, they almost are lower than your knees and it's nice to have your knees maybe slightly going forward when you play. So I'm going to do a little bit of reviewing of some of the principles of what we talked about today. <coughs> this summer, I know we talked a lot about when you breathe in and you breathe out to keep that awareness of your movable shoulder blades. Otherwise, what happens is your shoulder blades can freeze as you're playing. <coughs> it's a very old habit of mine, and I think all of us need to be aware. Here's the A, but I'm, again, I'm really being aware of trajectory and D. And then the frog moves in while the tip moves out. So unfortunately, with the angle of this, maybe I can lower it slightly. And then again, it's a great way to warm up in single motions. And then and I'm back to my William Harris Lee cello. I got it a long time ago in the 80s. Um, maybe if I lower it, I'm not sure if the stand will lower well. Oh, maybe it will. Ooh, that'd be nice. Okay, so we did uh, Tsena. Oh, you still can't see the bow. <laughs> Bummer. Oh, maybe it's also angle of the stand. Oh, silly me. It's a round. Oh, good. You can see the bow now. And there was a spot that was a little in. She opted instead of just normal first position, we decided it would be kind of fun to use it as an opportunity to learn a D major triad. And you do a 1-1 one, one shift from the three spot, one's on it, D F sharp, and then one on F sharp, E, or you can shift on the little step to three. But it was just a little out of tune, and the challenge is when we play with a rounded hand, do you see how the fingers point in toward each other? She helped me so much this summer in explaining that better. So instead, if I have my hand more like, it's got a little natural arch because of the way the palm has an arch, but it doesn't mean I have to round my hand for my intonation. So watch. I'm not sure you can really see it, but what we did. This is a great way to practice double stops. Do it separately and then together. We didn't do that at the lesson. That would have been smarter. But I'll send this to her and then she can practice at home. And I'm glad. I think I have it memorized. If I don't, ah, such is life. Oh, I, I, yeah, it's a down, down, up. So let me see if I can play that first section. First time to F sharp, then the second time. Like when I play in a mirror, 
that my forearm and hand just looked like it could be a little more flexible. repeated thing it's really neat or a falling scale that we use different dynamics so that we're always getting a sense of how could I naturally shape this and you could experiment with how everyone does different shapings to bring different things about. We started the lesson talking about double stops. So the four on the D and the three on the G, you can play those and you, do you see the fingertips are kind of pointing, the nails are pointing down slightly so I don't get that rounding. And then two and three, which would be um, A sharp and F sharp, or B flat and G flat, it's a minor sixth also. And then A and F. And then repeat it again. That's what's so fun about it. in the mirror. I can see, oh, that looks a little tighter. That looks a little more comfy. Not that the other thing was terribly uncomfortable. So at first you might want to pause because it feels a little bit of, like I'm playing a game of cello twister. I'm not used to using my fingers like this. Two and three feel really big. And it's odd because we don't do a lot with two and three, and we probably should, since we often do four and three and one and two in more beginning studies on the cello. So about bum, bum, beam, bum, we can do it about that tempo. I let the bow fall on the strings so things can be more relaxed, and then I do more of a staccato scooping with a slight articulation. Ready? And. And then again. with students I'll find a way to harmonize so that we're all playing different notes and I can hear if they're using their bow confidently or less confidently and now the other thing you can do is also work on sixths major six that was minor six because it's a fifth plus a minor second or a fifth plus a major second would be a major six major six Ooh, that's fun to say G to B flat and then F sharp to A. Now this is interesting because when you're doing a scale, the little steps in six don't change at the same time. In other words, this is Do to Mi. Do changes to T, but Mi goes to Re, so now it's a major six. And you have a choice here you can go to E on La and two on G on Sol, or so Do T La La Sol, and this is Mi Re Do T. So we'll do that double notes. I like to do because it gives you two shots at the note, and you just go down, up, and nice and relaxed. And you can kind of practice it where you sort of mirror it with the other hand because scooping motions help you sink and release. And there's sink and release happening, sinking in and releasing happening in both hands. Whew. So here we go. You don't have to just keep it locked down in either hand. Do la ti sol, and then la fa sol fa ti la. That's one where the sixths stay the same from minor six minor six. But then here, Sol, Mi, and then Fa, Re, C, A, and then Mi, Do. Now this one did involve open strings, but after a while you can learn six in a different key and it might not involve an open string and then you just have to finger everything more, so.
to slow down and practice it slower. What's interesting, well, let's take a key like F sharp or G flat. You wouldn't even have to know which one you're in, but this is gonna be my starting note. <laughs> I didn't use any um, open strings, so I didn't want to have to talk about whether it's F sharp or G flat and all that, but it's really good. That proves that I need to practice F sharp and G flat more because it's not as fluid for me as thinking in G major and C major. Not that I don't do pretty well in F flat and G, I mean G flat and F sharp. I'm a lot better than I used to be, which would be F sharp, E sharp, That's a whole other matter. F major, one flat. F sharp major has one natural B. One fa. A lot of times scales are hard for people because they haven't gotten used to playing scales that don't involve an open string. It's better to get really well in tune, I think, on scales that involve an open string. So even if I'm doing G major, I know how to do it without using an open string. But if I played it enough times, I can... without open strings. That way I can do vibrato. The other thing this that we really enjoyed this summer, this might be a good place, just let, so we're talking about using your hand more flat and opening the fingers. It's more like Mr. Spock, you know, this is doti, this is mi fa, but sometimes we do have to have those two, three moments. But you let your thumb rest and relax inside. You let your four rest here and maybe your thumb kind of on top like thumb position. And that's a great way to practice the vibrato motion. Just don't even worry about one and two at all. And the thumb is just resting and relaxing. So when I go and learn vibrato here, I don't worry about one and two in that way. Oh, my cello coughed, sorry. <laughs> about playing the higher note I'm just doing this for harmonization this cello doesn't get played as often and the bridge is a little higher so maybe that's the coughing sorry so it's doing a, a major third you can practice those separately and then also, I we did this at her lesson for G, F, E, F, just to give each finger a chance for vibrato. So what could we do? So that was one. something really well but if your brain goes somewhere else and then this was G, F, F. when I haven't played my cello lately or if the strings are getting old it's almost like hey what are you doing to me it's the cello cellos like to be played so play your cello every day feed it well so this would yeah it helps looking in a mirror is it balancing well in both the bow and the left hand. And then you might want to done. And then you can do what's called a quadruple stop, but you have to do it two notes. That's kind of fun. And turn early. 
In other words, lower in the frog, so you have more bow for the upper notes. And again, it's turning the corner like we did in those warm-up exercises. So we did the neat little Zena thing. strings. Another thing you can do is use the open string to shift. That's how I taught the student. So you see that I was using the open string to shift. If this is awkward, just because you haven't played in, uh, this would be third position, Laurel Bring, I shift up for the D, a very common shift on the cello. And then I shift up a major second from two on the four spot to two on A. And we just did this a bunch of times. To get comfortable with it, and then do the... So the whole song has that A section, two lines, B section, two lines, and then the A section returns. Uh, sandwich form, like twinkle, twinkle, little star, twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are, like a piece of bread, up above the world so high, like a diamond in the sky, same sound, but different words, it's two pieces of cheese, and then twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are, musical form, I have a certain form as a human being versus a raccoon, <laughs> and different pieces have different forms, sometimes they'll even have a C section, like rigadoon, a section, B section, C section, and then the return of the A section. There's something nice about having those bookends or that return of the original material in musical form. And then you can start doing improvisation. Like, let's say you're over there. Hi there. And I'm watching Nancy on Video Land. And you're playing like an open C. And I decide I'm going to do an improvisation over an open C. You can do this with yourself at home. It's really kind of cool. And then and so all that would be like so if you recorded like an open string or a finger note you could do an improvisation over your finger note there's also really cool YouTube recordings of Jamie Abersole doing different styles of jazz and different keys. And that's fun to play with as well. And let's see, what else did we do? Oh, we talked about do no no bees, where that lilts off do na no bees or do na no bees. So we don't go do na no bees. We, we do the first thing stronger and then just float off of it. Or you could change bows. That's another beautiful round. Oh, and we played on um, the... If you learn both parts, you could record yourself playing one part and then play along with the other one. The goal of teasing song, I think, is to increase your speed, have all of the accents and different things in place, um, softer with sforzandos and accents, and then, you know, um, then the second half of the piece is just all loud with a, a broader sense. 
And if you record yourself, you can play duets with yourself. It's more fun at lessons. So enjoy your lessons with whomever you're studying and have a great day.